Good morning, happy Sabbath. We would like to welcome you today, this morning. My name is Carlos Silva. On behalf of the pastor, Gresford Thomas, we are so thrilled that you decided to join us here this morning, rather here in the sanctuary or through the uh, media, uh, internet. And uh, we hope that you will feel God's presence as we lift his name in worship. I have a two announcements to share with you guys. Uh, number one is a church meeting. It will be no Monday, November 21st on 7 o'clock p.m. Also, I would like to reinforce the park and shop food pantry. Our pantry will be open and providing food to the community on Wednesday, November 23rd, from 4 to 6, do the Thanksgiving holiday. It's a call to worship. It is on um, Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 5 to 6. Nehemiah, chapter 9, 5 to 6. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is them. And you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. Amen. Let us pray. I would like to invite the church to stand for our invocation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we open our hearts, minds, and soul to worship you. Thank you for the day, and thank you, Lord, for us to have an opportunity to dwell in your kingdom and live in your presence. Thank you that as we gather together, we join with all the Christians across the world to glorify your holy name. Come, be with us, inspire us, and lead us in our time together, we ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Of him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. 
Above him there's no other Jesus is the way Jesus is the answer For the world today Above him there's no other Jesus is the way If you have some questions In the corner of your mind And traces of discouragement And peace you cannot find Reflections of your past Seem to face you every day But there's one thing that I know for sure
Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath to you. It's now time for a congregational prayer. If you would bow your heads, if you're comfortable kneeling, please do so. Okay. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you, Lord, for this beautiful day, the day you blessed and set aside for us to worship you in commemoration of your creation. We thank you, Lord, for taking care of us over the past week. We thank you for your many blessings you've bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord, because you are the God of creation. You are the only God that deserves our worship. And so we give praise, honor, glory, and adoration to you as we come together collectively as a congregation. We ask, O oh God, for your Holy Spirit to anoint each one of us. We pray, O oh God, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon this community, upon this city of Concord, and Lord, upon the whole nation of this world, their United States of America. We pray, Father God, for those who are not with us. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for the homeless. We pray your peace be with each and every one. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that we would all come together collectively. We would love one another, lift one another up, and pray for one another. And we pray, oh God, may your will be done in the life of each and every one of us. We're grateful and thankful to you, Lord, for the blessing you bestowed on us throughout the week. We thank you for all the goodness we've had, especially in our food pantry. We thank you for the provisions you've made for us so we have the food to pass out to our community as they come. We thank you, Lord, for teaching, helping us that we learn day by day, learn from your word, and as we learn, may we digest them and give us, Lord, the strength and the spiritual boldness that we go out and share your love with others. Oh, Father, we pray for those who are not able to come to church. We lift them up before you, and we ask may your will be done in them. We ask that you would bless our speaker today, anoint his lips, and the words he speaks, Lord, may we all hear them. May we take them into our heart and lives, digest them, and share with others. We pray for the nations of the world. Lord, we are living in troublous times. There are lots of turmoil going on in the world. So we pray for the people who've been cast out of their homes due to wars in all the different countries of the world. We pray your peace on them. And we pray, Lord, for those who are assisting them. We pray you would strengthen them, protect them, and keep them safe. Heavenly Father, Lord of glory, may whatever we say and do today, O oh Lord, be only to your honor and glory. We thank you for hearing our prayer. We thank you for the answers to our prayers. And Lord, whatever I fail to ask of you at this time, we pray, O oh God, may your will be done. We thank you as we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay. Would you please stand for the reading of the scripture? And our scripture reading is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 39 and 40, and verses 51 and 52. Luke 2, I start at verse 39. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned, to Naz uh, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in the spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. In verses 51 and 52. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and the hearers of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. 
It is a pleasure to be here this Sabbath morning. Pastor Gresford Thomas uh, invited me to come. I am Philip Williams, and I'm the principal, the new principal at the Pleasant Hill Adventist Academy. And my wife, Cheryl, is sitting there, and we are very, very happy to be here. We came to Northern California to live on August the 1st. So it hasn't been even four months yet, not exactly. It has been a busy, busy four months as we've gotten acclimated to a new school, a new city. We actually live five minutes from here and uh, getting to know just lots of people, lots of work. And so we're, we're newbies. Thank you for this invitation. I am excited also to see Deanne Brewer, uh, our vocalist this morning. Thank you for the music already. Deanne's father and I uh, actually go back uh, many, many decades. Uh, I worked under him when he was a pastor in New York back in the 70s. And he's now in his late 80s, living in Florida. And then years later, we were in the same city, New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, for some time together. But I haven't seen Deanna in 25 years, I think, and it's really just wonderful to hear her voice this morning. Well, as you can imagine, I am all about education and all about children. And as I scan this room, I'm almost feeling like I'm in the wrong place because I don't see too many. They may be online, and I hope that they are. Uh, my message this morning is especially for parents. And, um, and I'm going to guess at some point, some of you were parents, and maybe your grandparents like my wife and I, but I also uh, have a love for music. And I love when congregations sing a bit. And I have missed just that this morning. So I'm gonna ask you to join me in singing a, Maybe a medley, but uh, at least one of the songs. I'm going to go over and play the piano, so I need to give the, the, the people who are doing all of our sound a little notice to get ready. I'm going to use the mic that I think is there. But you know this, this little song. It's entitled, Jesus Loves Me. And I'd love for you to sing that with me. Thank you. 
go back to Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he. Would you sing that out with me now? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes. For the bar. time on that course. Sing it like you believe it. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Father, this morning as we prepare to open the Bible that tells us of your great love, we ask that you will please make it real to our hearts, those of us who are concerned about the children, the grandchildren that you've given to us, the children that are in this church, the children that are in this world. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice today in their behalf so that we may do your will in Jesus' name. Throughout this week, I had been moving uh, to speak on a completely different subject, and then something happened. My notes got somehow lost in my computer, and I don't know to this moment where those notes went, which then created a real crisis. As you can imagine, this last week of school, because school got out yesterday for the holiday, was busy with all kinds of wonderful Thanksgiving things and programs, and yesterday I ate all day long because there were parties and birthday parties and there were Thanksgiving lunches, and and I thought, what am I going to do to speak to this congregation this morning? And the Lord actually opened, maybe I should put this way, he closed a few other doors and he opened the door to this message this morning. It's entitled Raising Jesus. And I'm going to ask you to go back in your Bible to Luke chapter 2. Thank you, Ann Kumar, for reading it so nicely. But it's going to be our key passage. If you have your Bible, or as I do, my phone, I'm going to ask you to turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 39, verse 40, verse 51, and verse 52. Let's hear the word of God again. And this is entitled, Raising Jesus, Luke 2, 39, and 40. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Verse 40. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And now down to verse 51 and verse 52 of Luke chapter 2. And he went down with them, talking about Jesus, and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And prayed something in her prayer this morning that really resonates with me right now. She said, Lord, May we hear the word of God, and then may we apply it. 
I pray that that's going to be the case as you and I work together with these particular verses. The challenge of raising children, especially uh, today, seems to be an endless source of storylines and movies and TV programs. For instance, in 1987, a movie was entitled Raising Arizona. It told the preposterous story of a couple who couldn't have children kidnapping a child to raise as their own. Somebody called that a comedy, but you know kidnapping children is not a laughing matter. In 2004, the movie Raising Helen followed uh, Helen as she takes on the task of raising her nieces and nephew after the untimely death of their parents, her sister and her brother-in-law. The children actually raise her, making her a better person. And then seven years ago, a reality TV show came out entitled Raising Asia. At the time, Asia was an almost nine-year-old with a talent for dancing. The show focused on how her parents dealt with raising someone as precocious as Asia. The Rays, her parents, remind me most of the parents that our message this morning is focused on. Mary and Joseph. Now, within just, is it going to be a month maybe? We're going to hear a whole lot more about Mary and Joseph and their baby Jesus as we move to the celebration of the Christmas season. They become parents in a most startling way and were thrust into probably the greatest parenting challenge ever known to humankind. And they certainly wanted to get it right. But how do you raise the Son of God? How do you raise Jesus? I would suspect that very few of us in this audience today would want that responsibility. Yet before we delve into this question and its answers, we need to lay down a couple of other Bible verses and foundational material for our message this morning. So if you have your Bibles, and you do, would you turn to Matthew chapter 18? Matthew chapter 18. And I want to look at verses 1 through 6. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. By the way, I'm reading from the, uh, is the, the ESV, the English Standard Version. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Verse 2. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's listen up. Verse 4. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 5. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Hmm. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Hmm. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he calls to him a who? A child. And he puts that child in the middle of them, and he virtually says, this is the greatest. He is the greatest in the kingdom. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives a child in my name receives me. And one more text is foundation before we move on. Matthew chapter 25. Notice verse 45. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 45 gives us one more text to think on before we move into the major part of this message. Then he will answer them saying, this is Jesus, near the end of earth, truly, at the end of earth, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Did you notice the switch that Jesus makes in that first passage. He first says that his followers should be humble like children. 
But then he simply says, when you receive a child, you receive me. He reiterates that same idea in Matthew 25. When we mistreat, misuse, ignore, neglect the least of these, and who is the less important in the world's economy than children? He says, when you forget the least of these, you are forgetting me. Now, while you and I might understandably recoil from the idea of having the responsibility of raising the Son of God, in actuality, we are raising Jesus with every child we have to do with. Say that again. We are actually raising Jesus when we deal with every child that the Lord brings into our purview. These little, younger, smaller people are the least of these that Jesus identifies with. My wife and I were given the responsibility of three sons. They're all grown, and they have given us six grandchildren who are also growing up. And we would immediately say, well, those were our responsibility. But based upon this text, Jesus says, the least of these is me. The littlest of these is me. So let's look at the Bible narrative again, going back to Luke, to understand better what our responsibility is. How do you effectively and successfully raise Jesus? Well, Joseph and Mary are going to show us the way. Luke chapter 1. I'm just going to be reading these portions, but if you want to turn there, that's fine. Luke chapter 1, verse 35 through verse 38. Most of us know this story, and as I said, we're going to hear it again and again and again in the next 30 days as we celebrate Christmas. But Luke chapter 1, verse 35 through verse 38 says this, And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Verse 38. And Mary said, Behold. I am the, if you've got your Bibles, what's that next word? The servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. This child that Mary was about to give birth to, she understood was going to be called holy, the son of God, Nothing was going to be impossible to God that here a 17-year-old approximately young woman was going to bear a child, though she was not married and had never been involved sexually, but her child was going to be conceived of the Holy Spirit. If we're going to raise Jesus, we've got to start off by acknowledging the miraculousness and the wonder of his birth. That's what Mary's doing. It is during the Christmas season that we especially focus on what has become to be known as the Immaculate Conception. This mystical coming together of the Holy Spirit with the womb of a 17-year-old girl is indeed an event to wonder at. We know that on this conception hangs all of our hopes and our dreams as Christians. Jews do not accept the act of the Holy Spirit as legitimate and thus reject the Messiah that God sent, even though Isaiah said that a virgin would conceive. The Muslims see nothing supernatural here, and they only declare that Jesus was a good man and one of many good prophets that were sent from God. Atheists scoff at the very idea of the Holy Spirit, and so they certainly cannot fathom a joining of God and man as described in John when he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But notwithstanding all the doubters, the Christian follower listens with Mary with astonishment and believe when the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
Therefore, the child to be born to you will be called holy, the son of God, for nothing will be impossible with God. The Bible says that Mary was at first greatly troubled at the news. She wrestled to understand the meaning of it all and how it could happen. And one could certainly appreciate her anxiety and fearfulness. How often do angels visit us and give us shocking news about supernatural things that are going to happen directly to us? Probably never. But while we can stand in awe with Mary, we surely are amazed at Joseph's response. That brother was a gentleman all the way around. When he hears that his wife-to-be is now pregnant with someone else's baby, he has all the right to be upset, hurt, angry, and maybe ready to do some damage. But instead, the Bible says he was a just man and unwilling to put her to shame. This has got to be a God follower here that we're watching. Unwilling to put her to shame. Joseph was a man of God and surely one of the best men on earth to entrust the raising of Jesus to. But there's more. He was planning to quietly, you know the story, quietly divorce her when the angel gives him more information in a dream. Joseph, this is in chapter math, chapter 1 of Matthew, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. This is the starting place for how to raise Jesus. You recognize and accept that this child is a gift from the Holy Spirit. The little part we have to play, and I need to say this, the little part that we have to play in the conception of children is overrated. We like to think that if we're sensible parents, we think through the right time to have children based on our budgets. We consider how many children we should have based on our budgets. And then we proceed to enjoy the act of making babies. But talk to those parents who have done all the right things and are yet childless. They will tell you that this business of conceiving children is a holy work. It is a supernatural work. You just can't will a child into existence. God is at work in every conception. David put it this way, and we know this to be true in Psalms 139, 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. You don't hear David saying, well, what a wonderful thing happened when my parents got together. No, it's all about what God did and what God does. See, barrenness, not having children or the ability to have children, seems to be a rather common situation in the Bible for some notable characters. There's Abraham and Sarah. You remember that story? They couldn't have any children. Isaac comes along in their old age. Then there's Isaac and Rebekah. Couldn't have children either. And then Esau and Jacob show up. There is Elkanah and Hannah. You remember them? Hannah wanted children, could not have any children. Then there's Samuel. Manoah and his nameless wife wanted to have children, but they couldn't have them. And then there shows up Samson. There's Zechariah and Elizabeth finally having children in their old age. John the Baptist. It would appear that God uses barrenness as a symbol of the futility of human effort. Try as you may, you cannot have a child without God's intervention. In John chapter 1, verse 12, John says, All who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. Only God can knit the sperm and the egg together and bring forth a child. Only God can give the right for people to become the children of God. So how do you raise Jesus or 
Daniel or Angela or Nina, you start with understanding and acknowledging the wonder of birth. This child, this child, that child is not your child. This child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. You are given this child. You did little or nothing to get this child. Hannah said after giving birth to Samuel, she says, for this child I prayed. And the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. This is the high and holy regard that God places on every child. And we must never take it lightly on our children's or our origin or our children's origin. See, underlining all child abuse, child neglect, child disregard, child abandonment, child labor, child slavery is the lack of acceptance that all children and all adults are the result of the conception of the Holy Spirit. No wonder Jesus says abusers and neglectors should have a heavy boulder hung around their necks and thrown into the sea to drown. So pause a moment. Take a look at your children. I have to look at them in my mind's eye because they're not here. And remind yourself, these children are not my children. These children were conceived of the Holy Spirit. These children were given to me by the Almighty. And like Mary did, let my soul magnify the Lord. In Luke chapter 1, verse 38, and Matthew chapter 1, 24, there's another important reason and another important way in which we can raise Jesus. The Bible says, and they called his name Jesus. Mary and Joseph's response to this call on their lives that changed everything shows us where to go next. In Luke chapter 1, 38, after the angel says to Mary that nothing will be impossible with God, Mary unhesitatingly answers with these words. Listen to her words. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. After Joseph awakens from his very strange but compelling dream, the story says that he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Because in the dream, the angel had told him, you shall call his name Jesus. Do you see what's happening here? Raising Jesus for these two was serving the Lord. If you want to raise Jesus, you must understand that it is a call to serve the Lord. This is the opposite of serving yourself or even serving the child. Raising Jesus correctly is an act of serving the Lord. Raising Jesus is doing what God says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Now, may I put in here just a little caveat? This all applies not just to those of us who have biological children, but it also applies to those of us who have children in our sphere, in our churches, in our pathfinder clubs, in our whatever, our schools. We each are serving the Lord. You may not hear this idea at too many other places except in the Bible, but it is nonetheless the truth. Raising Jesus is servanthood to God. God determines who we're going to serve. You will serve him in the person of Jesus, in the person of Emmanuel, in the person of Grace, or in the person of Esther. And how we're going to serve him by obeying his commands. So often it's heard that children don't come into the world with an operation manual, and they don't, do they? 
The whole idea of raising children seems to be a hit or miss proposition from the beginning. And while it is a daunting task at best, we have not been left alone completely without direction. So when Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians to the men of Ephesus, saying, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipleship and the discipline and instruction of the Lord, he was enforcing or reinforcing the way God looks at raising Jesus. We would never knowingly provoke Jesus to anger. Our demeanor, though human, would be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And we must certainly bring Jesus up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The discipline and instruction of the Lord is the word of God and advice that's based on the word of God. In this business of raising Jesus or Nina or Anna or Charlie, our purpose is to serve the Lord. And this is a shift from what most of us instinctively think. There are parents who think that their purpose in raising Jesus is to serve the child. Children come with many needs. They are initially helpless, and for many years, they're incapable of doing everything for themselves. So surely they need to be served by warm, loving parents. But if the purpose in raising children is to serve the child, then serving the child could at times supersede serving the Lord. In 1884, the writer, the speaker, the prophetess Ellen White spoke at a camp meeting in Los Angeles. She was speaking on the subject of parental responsibility. Here's what she said. This softness of mothers, which they call love, allowing children to run things themselves, is the worst kind of love. When you pamper and pet your children, you are doing a wrong thing. Go to God, she says. Study the matter to learn what is your duty for yourself. When your children want to control you, take them to the word of God and show them that you cannot yield to their impulses. Interesting, 1884. Parents who serve the Lord put the Lord above their children. Can you say amen? Parents who serve the Lord put the Lord above serving themselves also. Someone once joked about why they had so many children. They said, I have children to help me do the housework. And while that person may have spoken in jest, this idea of raising children as a means of serving myself has taken hold in a lot of cultures. For many centuries, what untold horrors have gripped the lives of the children that God knitted together in their mother's wombs because their parents served themselves instead of serving the Lord. I've had conversations with parents, supposedly Christian parents, who have boldly declared, these are my children. I will raise them in the way I think is right. These parents have made one erroneous conclusion and one statement of rebellion in just that one sentence. These are not their children. They are God's. And raising them in the way that they think is right is in direct rebellion to the call of God to serve him in the raising of their children. So we need not get this thing out of balance. We do not serve the children. We do not serve ourselves. We serve the Lord when we are correctly raising Jesus. And my final point this morning. We raise Jesus by noting that there is a mission this child has from God. And we help them fulfill it. Let's look at Matthew again. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. You'll hear this wonderful text sung and read throughout the coming season, but it bears repeating. Verse 21 of chapter 1 of Matthew. She will bear a son, 
and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. Aren't you glad about that? I know I'm glad. Mary and Joseph may have thought that through the nine months of her pregnancy, they had their own little private secret. We don't know how many people they told that Mary was carrying a wonder child. Who really would have believed them anyway? So they kept all of that to themselves until the night Jesus was born and a bunch of shepherds showed up at the cattle stall where they are temporarily living, declaring that a chorus of angels had told them about the baby. In Luke 2, 19, Mary, the Bible says, treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. I bet she did. Strange men coming in, talking about angels, showing gladness for this child's birth. You better know she pondered those things in her heart. And then a week later, eight days to be exact, they go to Jerusalem, which was not too far from Bethlehem. They go to the temple to present their baby to the Lord and bring a thank offering. And up walks an old man and takes the baby out of their arm, holds him up to God, and blesses God and calls the child God's salvation a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And what does Luke write next? And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. The events that follow this scene in the temple are not given in a lot of detail. But what we know is this, Joseph and Mary stay in Bethlehem, apparently for a few more weeks. They receive a visit from the wise men from the east who bring him gifts. They're told to go to Egypt with their son because Herod wants to kill him. And they stay in Egypt at least for many months before they're permitted to return to Galilee. And they set up housekeeping back in Nazareth. Luke simply says after they get settled in Nazareth, Luke chapter 2, verse 40, we all know this text, and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And all this commotion in the first year of his life, in the first year of raising Jesus, Mary and Joseph are sure of at least one thing, Jesus has a mission. Jesus has a reason for being. And that their work is to help him prepare to complete the mission that God has given him. They're clear about that. If you're raising Jesus or Angela or Paul or anyone else that God has brought into your sphere, you are in mission preparation mode all the time. And what's that? You're paying attention. You're watching for clues about what gifts God has given to that child that he's put into your home or into your care. You may not hear the voice of an angel saying that this child has been set to save his people from their sins like Jesus, or he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines like Samson. But if you're serving the Lord and pondering these things in your heart, you're going to begin sensing there's a mission. Every child has a purpose for being here. Every one of us has a purpose for being here. You have a purpose for being here. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you, the Lord says. He has plans for every child. So if you're raising Jesus, then you're seeking God's plan for your child's life. You're praying, Lord, show me what your plan is for this child. Show him or her what your plan is. Show me how to cooperate with your plan. We have a faculty member this year at our school who has a, has a, has a fascinating story of growing up in a very difficult family. Difficult family situation where the members of her church became her surrogate family. After her mother's death, her father could not do a great 
job at keeping her, but those members of the church would step in and purchase things for her to wear to sing in the choir or took her on Pathfinder trips or even helped her get into academy because they saw those folk that there was a plan God had on that child's life. Notice how often in these miracle narratives, God has a plan for the parents to follow. Abraham leaves his homeland. Manoah makes sure his wife and son eat no grapes. Zechariah has to name his son John. Mary and Joseph go in and out of Egypt. There is a plan because there is a mission that children are called to complete. See, the basic job of parents is to get the kid ready for his or her mission. And don't forget it. The basic job of a parent is to get the kid ready for the mission that God is giving them. And, of course, this means that there is a very, this is a very important task. Now, I lived in Huntsville, Alabama for many years. Went to school there at our Adventist University came back 25 years later to be a teacher. Our sons pretty much were raised in Huntsville, Alabama. Some of you may know that Huntsville is the home of the original uh, industry that we now call aerospace. Astronauts get ready to go on their missions. There are various kinds of trainings that are included. Basic training, advanced training, mission-specific training, onboard training, proficiency, maintenance training. The mission-specific training alone takes about a year and a half. Most astronauts have been involved in basic and advanced training for most of their lives before they ever step inside a rocket. So many of them knew as young children that they wanted to work in aerospace. Their education in college was focused on that preparation. No one would ever doubt the importance of this training. No one goes on a mission without serious preparation. The mission is too important and the outcome is too important. Well, Joseph and Mary knew a little bit about Jesus' mission early on. But it became clearer when at 12 years old, you know the story, he tells them point blank, I must be about my father's business, even though he goes back home with them and they quietly keep working with him for the next 18 years. When we are raising God's children, we have to take into consideration the physical, the mental, the spiritual, the emotional development of our children. With deep earnestness, Ellen White writes, the mother of Jesus watched the unfolding of his powers and beheld the impress of perfection upon his character. With delight, she sought to encourage the bright, receptive mind. Through the Holy Spirit, she received wisdom to cooperate with the heavenly agencies in the development of this child who could claim only God as his father. We understand for sure how important it is for parents to nurture a physically healthy environment. We know that exercise and good nutrition and enough sleep and plenty of water are the foundations for a healthy body. We surely must agree that our children's spiritual natures must be nurtured through teaching them about God and showing them how to depend on him in prayer and listening to his voice as he speaks in his word. There is emotional health. That includes creating a loving home environment where father and mother model love, where appreciation and affection is expressed, and where each child is valued. Then there's mental development. It typically takes place in the arena of education, where I work, but it's informal and formal. From babyhood, faithful parents who are the servants of God educate their children, teaching them not only in spiritual ways, but teaching them how to dress, how to eat, how to become appropriately independent, how to read, write, use numbers. And when children get to a certain age where they need more advanced training, parents should then seek out schools where more sharpening and polishing can happen to prepare their child for the mission that God has given them. But this is where it gets tricky. 
The formal education that these children need must, however, be in the context of remembering that these children are God's children. All their education must be in that context. These are God's children. Did you know that there were, Jesus, there were schools in Jesus' day? Did you know that Mary would not send Jesus to those schools? Any self-respecting Jewish synagogue operated a school during the week for the children of the area. But Mary would never send Jesus there. Why? Well, according to the Desire of Ages, page 69, the teaching was not practical. It was very formal. The Jews, Jewish teaching had become influenced by the philosophy of the Greeks. Jewish tradition overshadowed the scriptures. The teachers were all about ceremony. Students weren't being taught material that was, was, they were being taught material that was worthless in God's sight. Having a personal acceptance of God's word was not valued. There was no time for students to spend with God. They couldn't hear his voice. In their search after knowledge, they turned away from God. This kind of education would get in the way of the mission that Jesus had. And in like manner, there are schools that his children should not attend today. In my years as an educator, it has been fascinating for me to watch some parents spend more time selecting a car that will eventually break down than selecting a school for their children. They look over pamphlets, they read statistics, they ask lots of questions, they consult car magazines, and then they make their purchase. Why? Because they want the best car for their money, and they want it to last a while. Those same parents will just let their zip code determine where their child will be educated. They don't ask any questions. They don't consult with the child's creator. They, don't, they spend no time looking at the curriculum. They know nothing about the teaching staff. And they fail to help God's children fulfill the mission that God has given them. And it's tragic. What would have happened to Jesus if Mary had taken such a cavalier attitude about Jesus' education. Thank God we will never know, but it is certain that the education she gave Jesus fit him to fulfill his destiny to be our savior. And I'm so glad that she did not fail in her important work. Let me close with this story. Susanna Wesley, may not be a name that you know at all. Susanna Wesley was the mother of many children, but two of her children were John and Charles Wesley. Some of us know that John Wesley was the founder of what we now call the Methodist Church. Charles Wesley was a prolific hymn writer, and we sing his hymns all the time. At Christmas time, we sing many of his hymns because some of them are carols. They lived in the 1700s. Susanna herself was the 25th child of her parents. Mm -hmm. And she bore 19 children, though only 10 of them survived. When John Wesley eulogized his mother, at her funeral. He said that she was the one single largest influence on his life for holiness and prayer. Susanna, a busy mother you can imagine, married to a man that was unable to emotionally help her much, took two hours each day to spend in prayer and Bible study. She homeschooled all her children and helped keep a family garden going. 
Now, to find a place to pray and study in a home with 10 children was no small feat. She was known to get the kids quiet, reading, and then she would sit in her rocker, cover her head with her apron. And when she was under her apron tent, the children knew that she was not to be disturbed. Hmm. Her example of faithfulness to God led her sons John and Charles to enter ministry and to impact the world in ways far beyond what she could have ever imagined. My brothers and sisters, we cannot know what will become of our children when we raise them as Jesus was raised. But we do know that we will have the approval of God. So today, I want to encourage all of us, those with biological children, those with just the children that God has brought into our sphere, Let's acknowledge that these children are miracles of God's grace and gifts from him. They are not ours, they are his. Let's remember that we are serving the Lord as we are serving them. And finally, let's remember that the greatest job that we have as parents, educators, church members is to prepare these children for the mission that God has given them. This morning I want to pray to close this part of our service and there may be someone as we are preparing to pray who can take this message to heart. Maybe you have children in your home. Maybe there are grandchildren in your home. Maybe there are children in your neighborhood, children in your extended family, and God is placing those children on your heart right now. As I pray, I'm going to ask you to silently pray. Pray their names. Ask God how you might better influence a child for him. Believing that we serve God as we serve these children. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we have been given grave responsibilities when you give to us children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and children in the church. Lord, we ask for help to raise Jesus, Thomas, Charlie, Charlotte, and all the other names that are being prayed right now. Help us to do our part in preparing them for their mission that you are giving to them. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the pastor and his wife. Bless them and their family. Bless each one under the sound of my voice and those who are listening through the airwaves. May we serve you today in Jesus' name, amen. things that you have done. I am grateful for the victories we won. I could go on and on and on about your words. 
Cause I'm grateful, grateful, so grateful just to praise you, Lord. Flowing from my heart are the issues of
the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jeremiah recognized God's manifestations, not as occasional, but as happening daily, regularly. How then should we respond to the Lord, a God that so regularly blesses his children? Numbers 28 and 29 reports about the Israelites' regularity in worshiping and giving to God, daily, weekly, monthly, and during all annual festivals. Concerning their offerings, for instance, they brought two lambs a year old without defect as a regular burnt offering each day. Interestingly, what they brought during the weekly, monthly, and annual festivals were besides, or in addition to, the regular burnt offering. The Israelites' worship pattern tells us that the best practice is not to be a sporadic worshiper. Only during Easter week, the Christmas season, or special Sabbaths, a God who manifests himself continually and regularly expects the same regular pattern of worship from his children. But how frequently should we give regular offerings? Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits, the first part, the best part, of all our increase, says Solomon indicating that we must worship the Lord with tithe and regular offerings as regularly as he sends us an income or increase. This wise giving system, triggered by God's giving, is fair even to those who do not have any income or increase. When God sends no income, there will also be no tithe and no offering. He would never expect something if he has not given us something. He is always the first to give, and our giving should be only a response to his giving but how much to give as regular offerings. God says that our giving should be in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. Paul also alludes to a proportional system when he says that one should give as he may prosper. Therefore, an intelligent way to give regular offerings is by deciding in your heart, in advance, the proportion or the percentage of our income to be dedicated to God as promise which is our regular offering, given besides the tithe. It is always a joy to participate in special offerings, supporting some good projects or ministries. However, it is appropriate that these occasional gifts and donations are besides, and in addition to, our regular and systematic offerings. As we worship God with our tithe and promise, we have an opportunity to partner with God and to express our gratitude for His regular care and provisions. May we put our desires last and God first. Good morning, saints. Can you imagine preparing and bringing a lamb or some other animal in your car every week to Concord International? (laughs) Consider the sweat and tears involved in getting your sacrifice ready and bringing it in your car to get it to the temple. This requirement was asked of each family of Jeremiah's time with additional offerings required for the yearly festivals. If you were wealthy enough to bring a lamb weekly to the temple, you did, even if your you only produced one to three lambs a year. But as the video stated, God provided their offerings. He provided their offerings. He made sure they had something to sacrifice. Today, God gives us our every need and in turn expects us to return tithes and offerings just as regularly as he provides for us. We should gladly return a portion of our receipts to him. Are you afraid of running out? It will never happen. As the offerings never ran out for Jeremiah and those of his generations, it will never run out for us. Psalms 34, 8 says, Taste and see, the Lord is good. Yes, he certainly is. Will the deacons please come forward and pray for prayer before collecting the tithes and offerings? Let's bow our heads. Oh Lord, your generosity towards us has no limits and it embraces all aspects of our existence. Make us generous as you are. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen.
These words from Pastor Gresford Thomas are in your bulletin. We are thrilled that you have decided to join us today. Would you join us now in the benediction? Let's stand, please. Now, Father, go with us out into the world to serve. We ask your blessings upon our coming week. We thank you for this holiday season where we spend time thinking about how grateful we are for the things that you've done for us. Bless us as we go now, in Jesus' name, amen.